And good evening, ladies and germans. My name is Scott Cleverton. And my name is Humta Serna. Uh, today is the 24th of September in the year of our Lord 2023. And we have a very special guest, a very old friend of ours who we haven't seen for literally Years. decades. Yes. Um, and he's been busy, fortunately. And um, we'd like to thank everybody who's here. Remember to share this, uh, subscribe, give it a like, and all those other cultural aspects of what we're doing. Uh, I would prefer to say something like, uh, without further ado. So yes, why don't you go. just let's why don't you just there. get stuck into it, Sumta? Today we're going to speak with Kirk Ellis about the writer strike and a lot of other other things. Kirk Ellis in the house. Yes. This is where we all pretend that we haven't been talking to each other for a half hour. <laughs> so I always find that. Do you do the? Have you done many of these sorts of things, Kirk? Yeah, since the strike, especially, I've been doing them pretty much every every uh, couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So well, we we knew Kirk back in the day in in the mid nineties. I think either you just done or you're about to do the Grass Harp. Wow, that's ninety. Four man, that's a, that's a long time ago. I yeah. think you've done that with Sterling Silifant and and all those sorts yeah. of things, and you were sort of like full full of the joys of spring. You know, you hadn't had any major bones broken by the business yet at that stage. <laughs> and uh, I always uh, remember Kirk as being one of the one of the most open, nicest, and most worldly Americans that I'd ever met. Um, I was kind of fresh off the boat in in many ways, and uh, and and our. One one of the great prejudices the rest of the world has about America is they think that uh, that culture doesn't exist there, and I am to tell them that they're entirely incorrect in that. And, and Kirk is one of those one of those fine people that I had the opportunity to meet uh, through some that that really proved proved me otherwise. Yes, I don't know why it was the first time. Do you remember Kirk? Um, I suspect that was because you and I met uh, with the uh, Bud Bedecker connection. Um, ah, down the road. Bad Bettica, yeah, wow. Oh my yeah, goodness. But I remember how you and I how you and I met him even through a through a previous paramour, but um um we were down together at his exhibition ring in Ramona, north of San Diego. Yes. Where he would show off Portuguese Lusitano horses. Yeah. Oh we were there. You were there also that day. I remember that. Okay. Yeah, that's how we that's how we met. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Ago. Uh, we might need to yes. explain to people because not everybody knows who Bud Bettiker is, yes. and if you don't, shame on you. But uh, Bud Bettiker was one of the most revolutionary f filmmakers in his day, uh, specifically regarding uh, the Western genre. He was one of the first uh, Western directors who actually made the bad guy uh, win at the end with uh, James Coburn in the film The Tall T. Um, and he was uh, an incredibly influential film filmmaker during the, the, the 40s and 50s and continued screenwriting. And uh, man, that, that guy had anecdotes for days. <laughs> and I've got, I mean, I, we will talk about that later, but my first book was actually about him in the films and uh, Bert Kennedy, his writer, and they both became great mentors of mine. And Assumpta had a very personal connection to Bud's last film, which is the last chapter of that book. So... That's how we all met. That, that was the connection. Yes, the, he, it was perfectly cinematic. And he wanted to do a movie with me that he never did. Oh, we still have the a script, horse for, uh, a horse for Mr. Barnum? Horse for Mr. Yes. Barnum. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I have still, I yeah. think, the script. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got a whole yeah. box of scripts for that in budgets and, and everything else. It was like, you know, was that, and we worked on that film for many, many years trying to get it set up, but Bud was at a point where I think he was questioning whether or not he could function in the new Hollywood that he had no familiarity with. And I think we're, you know, there for one of those incidents where things got really, really close. And then Bud found a way to torpedo it. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Well, this old Hollywood is, 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 is always very nice. I remember, you know, my manager back then in Hiller Telkins. I don't know if you met him. Hiller yeah, Telkins. 
Hilly was also Bud Bedecker's manager. That's how we got together. Yeah. Ah, that's it. That's it. That's it. And also, also <laughs> Hilly was Hilly was um, uh, James Coburn's manager. As well, yes. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I still have um, have Sandy, um, <clears throat> his wife, with me. He's uh, her. She's my manager also in in America. Still, I'm with yeah. <clears throat> this this is something I I feel very privileged because apart from meeting Kirk and meeting Bert, uh, meeting Bud Bettiker and also meeting Bert Kennedy, and going to Bert Kennedy's annual seventy fifth birthday party, um, the it was actually it, the seventieth birthday party. Oh, it was his 70th. annual seventieth. Um, I might have went to the fifth one. Um, <laughs> the the uh, that to have you know when you go to a man's house who li- you know who lives in Burbank Studio City and and he's got uh, John Wayne's Stetson on top of his TV and you know his six guns and everybody was such a gentleman. Um, it was I was very very privileged to have the opportunity to 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 touch. What what was old Hollywood? Yes. Uh, it's an extraordinary group of gentlemen. Well, you, you lived through this. Uh, you lived also, you know, a, a new Hollywood, or you know, and uh, and now you're living the the worst part of Hollywood, which is in the strike. Uh, what is your take? What do you think that that this industry is heading on? What and also, think? how does this compare to the last uh, big writer strike? Sure. Which yeah. So I. I, I before I became a member of the Guild many, many years ago, actually right after Grass Harp, so that would have been 1996, I covered not one, but two writer's strikes for the Hollywood Reporter as a journalist. Um, And the worst one before this was in 1985. And um, that unfortunately did not end well because people were out of work so long that they uh, were willing to compromise when they finally got back to the table. And as a result of that, writers lost out on a generation of income from VHS, DVD, and all of that aftermarket. Billions of dollars were given away um, as a result of that. Um, and the but I didn't was, understand why, why they were giving away? Why we, they couldn't? Because pe- people, people needed to get back to work. Um, mm. And the studios then and now would always say, look, We've heard these arguments before. We're hearing them now about streaming. They said, look, we don't know if anybody's ever going to rent or buy a VHS tape or they'll rent or buy a DVD. We don't know what the income stream is. Of course, they knew what it was. They had done projections. They knew that this was a whole new revenue stream that they could mine. And they didn't want to share any pieces of that. And in that particular strike we gave all that away in order to get some something small t- some small term gains some increases in salary and a chance to get back to work again and there wasn't that labor solidarity that there is now just to give you some some hollywood backstory there's a reason that the writers guild sad after it and the directors guild all negotiate separately because when each of these guilds did their contracts with, with the Hollywood studios and now the streamers and the multinational corporations, by design, we would always go to the table at different times so there could never be an industry-wide strike. And in the past, the Directors Guild, which is always the first guild that um, the studios go to because their contract comes up for renewal first, they sign a deal. Why they sign a deal, why they've never really been an organization that goes out on strike, I don't know. You'd have to ask a director. But in the past, whatever the directors agree to becomes the template for what the writers and the actors will sign off on. That didn't happen this year. And I think that the fact that the Writers Guild itself, and this is look, this is a bunch of writers. There are 12,000 writers in this guild, which means there are at least 25,000 opinions. Uh, it's not always a unified guild. So this year we were. It was, the, it was the largest authorization for strike in the history of the guild going back to the late 1930s. Then 
we stayed on the line. When it came time for the actors to make a decision, to everybody's surprise, I think including a lot of senior members of the Writers Guild, the actors voted overwhelmingly to go on strike. So that really stopped production dead, not only here, but as you know, in Spain, in England, uh, in, in, even in France, in, in parts of Europe, because, all of, because of all of the overlapping agreements. To give you a sense of how historic the strike is, the last time the writers and the actors went on strike together, Ronald Reagan was president, not of the United States, but of the Screen Actors Guild. In <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's that's how long it is. And so we are now approaching, we're within a month, maybe even less than that, I'm not sure exactly the number of days now, we're within a month of this becoming the longest writer's strike in the history of the industry. Uh, and we may get there. We may get there. You know, the, the studios and streamers finally sat down again with our negotiating committee yesterday, and things went at least well enough for them to be talking right now while we're live having this discussion. But we won't know the results of that until either an agreement is reached or the two sides agree to disagree yet again. This would be the third time that's happened in five months. Perhaps it'd be a, a good idea because um, not everybody's going to be watching this is going to un understand really the difference in what happened. Explain a little bit of how, how, how people were paid and how, what sort of form it took before this whole streaming boom and exactly yeah. how it's changed under Netflix, Apple, Amazon, etc. How exactly does it work now? Well, since Scott sort of let the cat out of the bag in terms of how long we've known each other, <laughs> uh, now, I can say that the industry that we all grew up in, that we're all familiar with, that doesn't exist anymore. So it's a very new landscape. It's a very new universe. But what, ha what, what the older industry provided was a lifestyle and a living wage for people. You're talking about an era when most of the viewing was on what we call linear television, the terrestrial networks. Here, CBS, ABC, NBC, Fox. And those networks, when they did a series, that series was 24 weeks. Uh, it was a year long uh, year of episodes with a break in the summer for new scripts to be written and the, the initial new production to, to start. But, and so you could, you could, you could have a job as a, as a showrunner, a creator of a show or a staff writer, and you could support your family on that. You knew that there was work to come. You would get, if you would know when the show was getting canceled and you could make arrangements to move to another show or to another network. Well, that it's very rare now that those shows are made. Sure they are, they're made, and they're the cop shows and the lawyer shows and the medical shows that are still on these networks, not only here, but on the BBC and on TF1 and RTL, name your European broadcaster. But streaming changed that. So the average show order for a streaming platform is at best 10 episodes. That's it. Um, some of these shows are eight. Some of them are six. Narratively, I don't understand a six-episode season. It always seems too short. It's not long enough to be a show, and it's too long to be a movie. Well, but, the, the, the other thing to interject is also the viewing habits have, in, have changed entirely. Yes. You yes. Know. People, I don't know how they do it, but... But people, well, you know, Money Heist, the new season of Money Heist comes out. Back in the day, it was House of Cards here in America. They watched the whole show, 13 episodes, in one go. And it's, they're done. And so, and they'll watch it on a phone, an iPad, uh, a laptop, or maybe their TV screens. So all this has changed. But what it's meant for writers specifically is that 
Um, if you're even if you're a creator of a show, that show is only your only guarantees that it's going to run maybe one season. But you're looking at a year of work um, just to get it, maybe two years of work to get it off the ground. Maybe you're writing it yourself. Maybe you have one or two writers in a writer's room who's working with you. Um, but you don't know if that work is going to last into multiple seasons. But let's say it does. So what, what the streamers especially have been really good at is saying to creators of shows, okay, put together what they call a mini room. Put together your select group of writers, maybe two or three, no more than that. Come up with what the first season looks like. Tell us what these episodes will be, who are the characters, what will their arcs be all the way through, what's the cliffhanger for the first season. Give us that. So you put this room together and you'll, the writers will get paid that you're working with. They'll get paid minimum wage for the time they're working on this. You'll present it to the streamer or even to the network now, and the network will say, that's great. We love it. We want to thank you and the other writers for the work you've done. And now we would like you, Kirk Ellis, to write all the episodes yourself. You don't need a room, you know, and we'll pay you for your services. But this is the other thing. This is the real fight. The, the, the AI, artificial intelligence, gets the headlines. But here's the real fight. Okay. Let's book in this with the two shows. So back in 2007, 2008, I did a show for HBO called John Adams, which was a seven-part miniseries um, that, when it aired, was their highest-rated show after The Sopranos. Now, this was in the old era. So the show went to VHS, and then it went to DVD. Now, for all of that, I got a residual for the show. Some days it was really significant. Um, every 4th of July, HBO would run the entire show as a marathon on the 4th of July. I always knew, because it took six months to get the check, I always knew where the Christmas present money was coming from, because I'd get that nice check from the 4th of July broadcast. So let's cut now to 2023, 2024. I just uh, last year spent last year in France doing an, a, an eight part uh, limited series for Apple about Benjamin Franklin's years in Paris. So here's what's different. It's for Apple, Apple Plus. There is no aftermarket. There is no DVD. There is no VHS. There is no foreign sale. Apple owns the rights to the show around the world in perpetuity. So what I was paid for the show, what the director was paid for the show, and what all of our actors were paid for the show, that's the only money we will ever see from this program. As long as it's on Apple, there will be no more money coming to us as artists. And at any point, and this has already happened on every streaming platform, Apple could say, hmm, you know, let's say this is a year later, let's say it's a month later. You know, everybody who's watched Franklin has watched it. So let's just take it off the platform permanently. At that point, there doesn't even exist a record of the year of production that we spent, the six years of development I spent writing the scripts and putting the show together. It's like it never existed. This is an existential moment for people who live and work in the film industry. And the curious well, part of it is the only thing that will, will re remain will be the people who've taken the time to pirate it. Right, that's right, exactly. That's literally the <laughs> only way you'll be able to get your hands on a copy would be, in quotes, illegally, because yeah. there's no so, legal version that exists. And then that's, there's, there's a huge, there's a huge um, uh, subsidiary problem with that, because 
when Jen Adams is made, uh, we know that the show, the DVDs were used in 12,000 school districts around the U.S. to teach um, late elementary school, junior high, and high school students about the American Revolution. Because it was a way to get to, you know, it's a dull war uh, for a lot of kids. <laughs> this, was a way, this was a way to get them interested in it. My wife, who was a teacher at the time, used the show. So what is the school district going to do if they want to show the story about Benjamin Franklin? Are they going to buy a subscription to Apple for every classroom, for every student to put on his or her no. laptop? How does that work? What is the education? I mean, I don't know this. There may be Apple may come to me next year and go, oh, no, we've got this all worked out. Here's how it's going to happen. I don't know. But economically what it means is is that no matter how well paid any of us are and make no mistake i was not hurting from my salary on the show last year we're making less money now than when any of us start in terms of the work we put in um for what we get out of it um for feature film writers for instance the situation has been I think we're going on the third contract it's been like this. As a feature film writer, you're hired to write one draft of a screenplay. That's it. And we all know that as soon as you turn it in, you're never going to hear from anybody again. And they'll bring on, either the producer or the studio, will bring on the writer they wanted in the first place. So one of the, one of the sticking points from, from the feature film side is feature film writers, and I've worked in both, saying, understandably, look, we want a two-step deal. We, if, if you're going to give us notes, let us look at the notes, let us incorporate the notes, and then if that point we don't agree, fine. But give us a chance to at least do a rewrite on the script. But why don't, um, they want to, why don't they want to do that? Why did they want to start up all over again with a brand new pair of eyes? Why would that be? What would be the logic okay, so there? I don't understand it. I, I was giving a film history lecture here in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico yesterday, and I talked about this. Throughout its history, whenever there are major changes in the technology of the motion picture industry, uh, whether that is talking pictures, films in color, television, then cable television, now streaming, the industry runs for cover. It doesn't know how to function, and it looks for a new business model. And that model always involves changing the way the creative system works. And it's always creatives who get the short end of it. Because as you go through this, the, the level of respect, I, I, I've been working in this industry now even longer than I met you, and I'll date myself. I mean, I became a, I became a, a journalist um, working in the LA, in the LA um, film and culture industry back in the, what, the, the mid-80s? So we're going on 45 years of this now, 40 years that I've been experiencing this, both as somebody who chronicled the changes and somebody who's living with the change. I've never seen a greater level of disrespect for artists in the motion picture industry and television industry than I have today. And I think that's true of the labor, system, the labor situation in America in general. And one of the things that's happening now that the, the mainstream media in America is finally understanding is that this is a pivotal moment for labor in this country. Support for labor unions which had been declining kind of precipitously over the last, well, really since Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, um, <laughs> um, now been on the increase. More, more people support the writers and, and, and actors than do the, the billionaires who run the studios and streamers. But it's also true that it's true with the people who are now on strike who build America's cars. Uh, it, it's true of you've got Starbucks workers who are unionizing. During the middle of the writer's strike, 
a strip club in L.A. organized under the Screen Actors Guild's contract and marched on the picket lines in Burbank. I don't know whether so, that says something about strippers or says something about actors. I'm not really sure there. <laughs> yeah, I sort of threw that in, you know, just so <laughs> that you could think about it. But there's a reason, for instance, one of the things that one of the one of the big labor disruptions that people were fearing in August was the strike of one million drivers for United Parcel Service, which would have crippled interstate commerce in America for an indefinite period of time. That strike didn't happen because UPS, not even at the last minute, well before the expiration of the contract, made a deal. I'm convinced the reason that deal was made was because you had 200,000 actors and writers on a picket line uh, getting a lot of public support. They didn't. They knew that was going to happen with them. So this is a really, really big deal. And that's why I think even though there's no negotiations happening now, that it's going to be going on for a while. I, would, I was optimistically thinking when we went on strike back in, on May 2nd that we would be maybe over in October. I don't know. Even if they came to a deal today, it's a month, a month and a half before any votes are taken and we know. I'm thinking the strike is going to go on until the end of the year, uh, until Christmas at least. And I hope. How do, I hope how do you what, how how do you see is is the the optimal way because presume because we have no physical media anymore. There's no there's no right. there's no there's no Blu-rays apart from from people who want to collect them for the most part, and those are you know franchise movies for the you know for want of a better word. There's, there's no other way to, to, to buy or sell these particular properties. Um, before everything was on network TV, where everything was made through through you know foreign sales, etc., and also for advertising, which was at a premium. Um, yeah. How will the model, or what model do you think will be applied in terms of streaming to perhaps, because I've heard, read horror stories about actors who are playing the lead in a, in a, a very popular Netflix show and they've had to go back to work as a personal trainer because they can't get arrested yeah. as, an, as an actor and they're just not making enough money to live. What's, but their right. show's been seen millions of times. Right, right. And see, that's, that's one of the things that, it, it, it's a black box. It's like that box that you have to recover from the bottom of the sea in a, in a, a plane crash. Um, or, or an air, you know, any kind of airline accident. The streamers don't want us to know how many eyeballs are on a show. Now, they say, look, we have no way to, we have no way to measure this. Of course they do. Turn on Amazon, turn on Netflix, turn on Hulu. You immediately get thrown onto an algorithm that says, well, if you like John Adams, You'll love these other shows. So they know what you're watching. So one of the proposals that we made that I think was made with discussion with the Screen Actors Guild Committee was, look, okay, we get it. You don't want us to know how rich everybody is over there. We're not going to ask you to do that. What we're saying is, give us a look. Give us just open up the black box a little bit, okay? Let us know how many eye, let us know how many eyeballs may be in there. And how about this? Based on how successful that program is to your platform, give our directors, actors, and writers a piece of that income. How about that? You know, just and they're saying you know, up until now it was like, no, we don't even want you to know that. But, but I think that is going is going against their own uh, business because what you want to know as a writer and as a creator is what the audience likes. Right. I mean, well, is, is I, one I, of the is one of the inspirations for you and for for us to actually work better. So, right. It, well, so, the, so the industry. Getting back to Scott's point as well is that see the industry adopted. This Silicon Valley model, which was the model for the streamers, was like the streamers were a delivery system. They were not originally in the, in, in, I hate this term, but I have to use it, the content business. You know, that's what, simply that's what you and I are. We are content providers. 
Yes, yeah, so and on that you. note, if you don't like to just uh, subscribe, <laughs> uh, hit the bell, <laughs> and all of those particular things. Yeah. No, it's, so, it's, so it's like, so, so the, the, the business model that Disney and Paramount and, and, and Warner Brothers, you know, which is now Max or uh, Warner Discovery, they adopted was the Silicon Valley model, which was never the model for the motion picture and television industry, which was based on this industrial system, this factory system. You know, a, 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 a group of artists get together to do, um, to create something that leads to something else that leads to something else. And there are these profits that are shared by everybody. That was never the model for the streamers. It was always about, because when they got into the, the business of creating the material they were now sending out around the world, it became very different. And the, but the model never changed. And you now have the studios realizing that unlike DVD and, and Blu-ray, maybe the money they thought they were going to make isn't what they thought. And you're seeing that now. Major layoffs at some of the streamers, particularly the ones that are owned by the more traditional industry models. Well, it's one of the things that I, I was uh, listening on to um, uh, onto a live stream um, on a, a, a channel called Film Threat. And they were interviewing oh, yeah. uh, a writer called uh, Jim Agnew. And and he his theory was, was rather harrowing because he was saying, I don't think they want everybody to know how many people watch their shows because their stock price is based on the idea that a lot of people watch their shows. Yeah, perhaps it's not that many. <laughs> so if they pull back the curtain to show The Wizard of Oz and it turns out instead of 10 million people have seen it, 150,000 people have seen it, their stock is going to go through the floor and everything is built on this idea that something is extraordinarily popular and that everybody watches it. But they have their own top 10 lists. You know, yeah. it, you know. Yeah. So, the Jim Agnew, what he was saying, he was saying, I don't think we're going to get that because they're terrified that if the numbers, the real numbers, do come out, that it will be an absolute massacre. Uh, but, but that is like uh, like all bubbles, no? Uh, they have to burst. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's like well, that's, what, that's what everyone's talking about. By the way, I agree with Jim Agnew. I think that's absolutely true because. If you're hiding something, there's a good reason you're hiding it from people. Exactly. And they've already seen the stock price. I mean, look at, you know, look at look at what look at what statements were coming out of the executive offices, particularly from David Zasloff at, at Warner Discovery, who was crowing to, um, and you know, trumpeting the fact that because of the strike, they saved two hundred million dollars in their second quarter because they could shave off all these production deals with expensive A-list actors and directors, and, well, not directors, and, but showrunners, um, and they weren't making as much product, so they didn't have as much expense. So, In yeah. a moment where, where also, also they were uh, having less viewers, because I remember yeah. that... Huh? Netflix was was a little bit worried after all this uh, well, pandemic. The well, the other thing that Netflix, which sold its, um, basically sold itself throughout, you know, when it came to Europe for the first time, which was there's nothing kinder than giving your your uh, your grandmother your Netflix password. So what happened? <laughs> that's how they sold it. That's and everybody, everybody had they were sharing their passwords with like everybody. You know, everybody had Netflix. It was like, you know, it was like, uh, you know, they were giving it. Hey, buddy, you want to get some of this? <laughs> let me just give you a here. Let me just slip you a password here, okay? And we'll get Disney Plus in a minute. But you know, so that's what was going on there. And then what happened last year is that they suddenly made it draconian that you couldn't. All these six people who right. you were sharing your password with, they, they could no longer use it. That and the right. fact that we're we're dealing with a with a film culture that makes a film Warner's makes a film like Batgirl. It costs you know ninety million dollars. Yes. They watch it and they go. Right, I think it's best if we don't show anybody this. <laughs> that is never right. really ha that. That's an extraordinary that's, state of affairs. That's no, that was scary to a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. But it was that very fact. It's like that's a hundred million dollar investment. And they go, eh, whatever, we're done. Nobody, nobody will see it now. Wow, that's we. It's it's really something that, it's something that the great uh, sage uh, Adam Carolla has said. One thing is fuck you money, but what they've got is fuck me money. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? I got so much money, I, can, I don't care if I, you know, I cut one of my toes off. Who cares? I got, I got nine more. But now you're opening the door to, like, what does it look like? Let's say there's a, a settlement tomorrow with the Rangers, and now it's, it's a deal that actors have very different concerns, obviously, except for things like AI and salary. But uh, let's say the actors come to a deal. So what does that mean for us on the other side? Well, I, I think even if we get everything we want and we won't, there's going to be fewer projects out there. They're going to be making this era of 500 new shows a year on, on uh, traditional cable and streaming. That's over with. Um, the era of shows like Succession or Breaking Bad or... The Sopranos, if you're going back to some of the classic or even White Lotus, uh, it, that's over too. I how, mean, but how many real... how, how many shows uh, they do uh, more or less uh, last year uh, between Almost Apple? All, well, before the strike, if you did, if you looked at across media, uh, the networks, cable, streaming, there were close to 600 shows. Wow. So it was a little bit more than before. Yeah, yeah, and but I I remember John Landgraf, who was and is the president of FX, which is the purveyor of some really quality stuff. Whether that's Atlanta um, or uh, Reservation Dogs, one of the best shows on American television now, um, saying at the time this is you know eight years ago, saying this is a bubble that's going to have to burst. Well, guess what? It's bursting, uh, and. It, it's, there aren't going to be that many shows, and we're all competing. We, we will all be competing for those jobs when we're back to work. And that's going to be compounded by a discussion that was going on in this country well before the strikes, which is this issue of who owns a, a certain narrative, who gets to tell a story. Um, will I get to tell stories about women or Native Americans or uh, the early history of slavery and things like that? Or will writers who have been uh, traditionally underrepresented, will they be the ones now to uh, herald those shows, to become the showrunners on those shows? But where are we going to get in television this new generation of people who understand not only how to write a show, but how to produce it. Because one of the things streaming has done is it's, it's, it's eliminated that training ground. You know, in, the, in, the, in the, the, high, the heyday of television, from live television in the 50s to its rebirth, really, under HBO in the 70s and 80s, you, know, you had this, it was, it, was, it was a writer's room. And so there was, there was a head writer, there was this group of people who worked with them on the stories, And those people would then go onto the sets and they would become the showrunner's representative for each week's show. And that's how they learned how a show is produced. There's, a, there's, another, aspect, there, there's another aspect of this sociologically, which is very, very dangerous, is, is I can see. If, if, if the idea that, that people from, certain, from certain, only certain groups can tell only certain types of stories, then we're opening ourselves up to the exposure where, well, that means you can't fire me. Um, yeah. So you're now in the state where it, you, that you're creating a, a future liability because you've already stipulated that I need somebody of this particular group to be able to tell this particular story. So thus, if I eliminate this person from the process, then I'm guilty of the thing, most likely the story that they're trying to tell in one way or another. Yeah, but there's so many writers that they do another show, no? No, no, no. But the, but the, this is the thing is that um, this is this this concept of positive discrimination is that uh, you, you know you don't leave college and you you know you write a script when you're 25. I mean we all we all know that the the old adage that nobody writes a script a good a decent script before the age of 30. I mean that's yeah at if least you're <laughs> if you're lucky. But but the 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 whole point is is the idea that uh, you know. The idea of, you know, and I hate to use the word by identity politics, um, and, and something which is an extremely technical, extremely creative, and extremely experienced and knowledge-based right. craft, 
and the idea of they're saying that the, the, the concept that there's going to be quotas. I don't know how, how, do, how are you dealing with that? How is that, how is that um, well, that's coming to you? Probably the topic for a separate show. I mean, yeah. just to, to sort of give you a repast to what you were saying earlier, certainly that issue of um, uh, diversity didn't stop the studios from canceling deals from people of color the same way it did from everybody else uh, in order to save this money during the strike. So that kind of talk only goes so far. Yeah. Um, but one thing I, I, I should really, I should comment on, because I, I, I don't want to seem dismissive of it, is this issue of artificial intelligence. Um, of course. And I, I want to be really clear about what it is, okay? Artificial intelligence is not a creative tool. Artificial intelligence is a plagiarism tool. Artificial intelligence scoops up everything that's been written, um, every image that's been produced. As we now know from the recent controversy with Stephen Fry, every voice that's ever been on an audio recording, that's ever been in a film, and is capable of reproducing it. I can, there's, a, there's, a, there's an app I can put on, I can talk for 30 seconds, and it can then translate my words and also adjust my lip movements in 14 different languages. So, um, so AI is never going to replace creative, uh, the, the, the creative arts, but actors know the danger. Uh, this was a danger that started back when the, the last actor strike, when you had commercials where Fred Astaire's image was being used. Marilyn Monroe, yes. For all that, yes, there's all that Marilyn Monroe. They're selling shampoo and they're selling uh, they're selling toilet cleaners. So <laughs> there's that. But here's what here's what the studios can do for with with AI for writers. They can say, look, give me a give me an give me an Assumpta Assumpta Serna Scott Cleverton Western set in Mars AI. Write that script for me. They'd be like, okay. another one? Jesus. <laughs> Isn't the world sick of those cl Serna Cleverden caper comedies on other planets? Jeez. And it, will, and it will generate that, and it will be terrible. But that will become the existing intellectual property, IP, that a studio presents to me and says, write a script. Here's the story for it. Now, the studios came back to the Writers Guild and less negotiations saying, look, we, we will agree that AI will never be considered source material uh, and that a writer would never have to compete or arbitrate for credit on a show that's generated by AI. And our response was, well, thanks for that, but that's really not an offer for anything. So, um, because nobody knows what AI can do. Uh, and fortunately, there are now a lot of high-powered conversations going on in the scientific and governmental and NGO communities about where it can be applied positively. And it undoubtedly has positive aspects. But for our business, I'm not seeing the upside to AI. I can only see negative impacts to this. One of, one of the great things with AI is it's, a, it's an amazing way to see a great list of bad ideas. That's that's one of the things yeah. that, that that I've actually... Uh, well, Kirk appears to have fallen into, fallen into... Oh, there he is. I'm here. I'm here. I just had to plug in my phone again. Sorry okay. about that. Yeah. No, it's it's yeah. one of the things that AI seems to seems to have ended up being very rather good at is, uh, is, is, is suggesting very, very bad ideas. Well, uh, I think you're upside yeah. down, Kirk. Yeah. Kirk, unless you're unless you're calling from Australia, that's a little. Can you turn your phone oh, the other way? Right. <laughs> yeah, how about this? I do this. There we yeah, go. That, that, that. Yes. That, there we go. There make we sure go. we can see, make yeah. sure we can see you. Make sure we can see your face. There we go. There we so, go. There we are. Look good. Yeah. Uh, he's representing. Got the shirt on and everything. Uh, <laughs> so it's so um, this this is a very interesting thing. Apart from the fact that it's a little bit like speaking to a demon. Um, have you have you? <laughs> Well, it's a little bit like, I mean, the first time you encounter it, you go, what is this? You know, kill it with fire. I mean, um, what what was your first experience with using it? Because it, I, I read um, an article, it was uh, about Barbara At Atwood, 
who's basically saying, where do you think they get it from? They have basically culled, harvested, and collated the sum total of, of uh, you know, right. the, the, the idea of creative thinking. And it's sort of throwing the dice through an algorithm. And, and why we are not asking for, for percentage of this? So, to answer Scott's question, and this is an honest answer, I've never used AI, and I don't intend to start. Okay. Uh, um, and so, I seem to right now, there's no, pers well, there is a percentage for authors. Right now, um, you've got major writers like George R. R. Martin, the author of Game of Thrones, Margaret Atwood with uh, Handmaid's Tale, several other best-selling authors here in America who have gone to Congress to say, look, this is copyrighted material. Exactly. And, and we need to get paid for it. But I'll tell you where this started. And this goes back when we were all younger than even when we met before. The record industry started this with a device called MP3. And MP3 was it was it was was it was a an electronic program where you could get free content, and a whole generation of listeners was raised on this idea that I can get things for free, and it created this idea, this entitlement, that why should I pay for when content? This is, exactly. This is what. This is why when when Netflix announced that you could no longer share the password. I mean, you thought a nuclear attack was coming. People were so outraged about this. Um, so there is, a, there, is a, there is a culture of, I don't want to call it disrespect, because I don't think that's true. I think it's a culture of, of oblivion or obliviousness <laughs> where people simply don't understand yes. that behind the work, yes. There are people who do it who need to get paid for it. But but you, you know? see, th that is what it, uh, it really strikes me from this strike, <laughs> which is uh, I don't think that these people, the executives and, and, and these platforms, they know anything about our business. They don't care. They don't care. They don't, care. Care. They don't they want don't to care. know. They don't want to know yeah. because if not, we, we would be approached. Say, hey, how you do that? You know, how, wh what do you think? What, uh, you know, well, no, the, the they other... don't care. I'd be talking long enough, I'd start to get really angry at somebody. <laughs> so, there's, there is, make no mistake, there is a tremendous groundswell of anger. And I think that was really best expressed by Fran Drescher, the head of SAG AFTRA, when she announced that the actors were going to go on strike. And in unscripted remarks that, I mean, went viral, even among writers, it said, she said, she called out corporate greed. She, she called out a system of disrespect. And she's still doing that when she's on the picket lines. And so that's also what this is involved with. I mean, when, when the head of Disney from his yacht gives a statement to mainstream media in America saying, you know, the writers are causing a tremendous amount of hardship and economic suffering on a lot of people in the business. I, I mean, how do you take that seriously? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, 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 you know, you would like to have, you'd like to have 20 years old to put a bomb. <laughs> Sometimes, please, please. We're not, hey, hey. No, but then, you know, but one, uh, no. one, no, but one of the, pro one of the, one of the problems, one of the problems is, look, it's, you know, it's classic manipulative tactics is what you're going to do is you're going to blame the other side for something that you've done. I mean, that's just how it works. Always accuse the other right. person of the, of the crime that you've committed. That's how, that's how it happens. The other thing that's happened is it's happened at the exact time when Disney seems to be in a perfect storm of destroying every single property and franchise it touches. Yes. Isn't that curious? <laughs> You know, when you've got the, uh, you it's know, it's like all imploding. Young actresses destroying their careers by going, oh, I mean, you know, uh, Sleeping Beauty isn't interested in any prince, honestly. I mean, what kind of what kind of story is that? You know, which hasn't helped <laughs> it. And then you've got Star Wars, which had the most dedicated fandom in history, um, yeah. who are kind of like, yeah, yeah, not for us anymore. Don't know what happened there, and and yeah. Pixar, yeah. you know, yeah. Pixar, which was like. A Pixar movie came out. You saw it. It was absolute genius. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. And everybody's like, nah. 
to go, you know, I always ask my students and go, what's the opposite of love? And they go hate. And I go, no, it's indifference. You know, and that's yeah. where we, that's kind of where we come to, you know, these, these valuable properties, which the people who have these valuable properties are kind of like, you know, throwing the dice and, oh, well, it didn't work, you know. That, yes. This uh, disrespect, this regard to oblivion, um, uh, I think also it makes me very sad is this this lack of opportunities of actually having a dialogue, no? Right, right. Yeah. No, people aren't people aren't talking to each other, and that's 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 one a of problem. The that, that's one of the things that we're talking about in the writers' field. It's like, look, you know, these rooms are necessary. The way good stories come out, especially on any kind of show that runs multiple seasons, is there are people in the room to give it new energy, to reinvent it, to provide a different perspective. Without yes. that, it just gets locked into something. Yes. Uh, and some creators, like I love Mike White and what he's done with two seasons of White Lotus. Oh, uh, yes. It is terrific. Beautiful, you know, terrific, terrific, yes. But, but there's just something about White Lotus in itself is that the fact that it exists and exists in that with its tone, texture, thematic elements and its absolute quality which in is in and of itself appears subversive that's right that's right exactly but then you can look at shows like downton abbey with one writer all the way through after a certain number of seasons it's the same show every week uh whereas a show like mad men or breaking bad always found a new angle to things because of of what happened um, uh, to the show as they were moving through production. So, but this issue of dialogue, this issue, this issue of we're, we're living in an era that is, it's full of, on the political level, it's full of narcissists in every country um, and, and nationalism. Mm -hmm. It's all about us against the other. Um, yes. And we're living in, we're living in a media <laughs> land today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Know thy selfie. Yeah, you watch it. It's a media landscape where people are watching things on a phone. Uh, or when I was on the, the board of the television academy for the writer's branch for years, we would have people come in and talk to us about new viewing habits. And the slide that would always come up was somebody in a living room. And there's generally like an exercise machine in the corner. And there's a TV somewhere. And then there's a an iPad or a laptop and a phone and somebody's watching all three at the same time. And I thought that's never going to happen. This person is talking nonsense. Well, that person turned out to be a prophet because that's exactly what's happening now. And the studios I think are saying, I don't know what they're saying right now to our negotiating committee, but I think what they're saying to us as artists is look guys, this is how people are watching your movies. This is people watching your TV shows, okay? You are something to occupy this liminal space when they've got nothing else to do. Get off our backs about how much money you make and be thankful you've got a job. I think that's the attitude. It's prevailing right now. It's awful. Oh, yeah. It's awful. That's what? that's what's happening to 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 actors. Uh, do you think that there are uh, too many writers? <laughs> <laughs> that's a loaded question. Um, I should say that. Let me answer that question a different way. Okay, there are still parts of the writing profession in our industry that aren't unionized. Animation writers. Um, Writers for um, um, internet, writers for short form uh, <clears throat> videos that, that aren't unionized. So we don't represent everybody who's writing there. Do I think there are too many writers? Look, I mean, throw a rock in, in LA and New York and you'll hit one. Uh, but whether or not they're actually produced. But I, I don't think that we run out of stories to tell. And there's always somebody who has an idea for a story that I wouldn't have thought of or somebody senior to me on the Guild has thought of. So, no, I don't think there are. In the same way, I don't think there are too many actors. Uh, but but it's, it's about, it's at this point, I'll admit this, I haven't really talked about this publicly, although 
I've spoken to it, you know, here at the house and among friends. I have to look at what I'm going to do once this strike is over. Uh, before we got in the air, I was talking about what a positive experience I had in Europe and the difference in the authorship system in Europe and how I'd like to do more projects over there. So I'm hoping that those projects that, that I had to walk away from, I could step back into or find new projects to join. But here in America, I don't know. I was lucky enough to to work on this first book um, during COVID and around the yes. time that Franklin, around the time that Franklin was going through yet another production iteration. Then I'm, we've been working on a second one now, a longer book that's more of a social history of America, social and cultural history. So you don't make money writing books. You really don't. There's no money in it at all. Anybody listening to this, don't write a book. You're never going to get rich that's, doing it. Uh, sometimes we're but writing a book right now. We're you writing know. a book, uh, Care 2, and I understand so well. I mean, I, sometimes, you know, today, actually, I was thinking, what the, what are you doing? <laughs> that's not making but you money. It's really so satisfying because... There's yeah. nobody looking over your shoulder. Even when he gets the editorial process, um, it's not what you feel. So there's that. So there's that free. <clears throat> so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I've had the career that I've had because nobody who was as young as I was when I started coming up through the industry now could have my career. It just wouldn't be possible because. The, the stepping stones don't exist. The training ground doesn't exist. The level, what we were talking about with the socialization, the connections don't exist. Uh, the, the need to meet people because the culture now is all about five people in the room talking to each other on their phones by text or by WhatsApp. So I saw that on our crew. It's like, why don't you guys just talk to each other? You're right there. Um, and it was easier for them just to sort of communicate on WhatsApp. So all of these things are playing into where we are now creatively. And I've never been terribly optimistic as a person. Um, in fact, I've been pretty misanthropic. But a misanthrope, <laughs> by, misanthrope by my definition, is an optimist who's simply been disappointed too many times by other people. So uh, yeah, it's like a broken clock. You're right at least twice a day. I mean, that's that's the thing that's going on there. He's right oh, about that. Oh, he's right about the shitty things twice a day. Call <laughs> me a failed optimist, but we will come out of this. But we are all going to have to be prepared for what that landscape looks like when we're out of it and where we're going to find a place in it. I got I got a question for you. What what what's the worst thing that can happen? What's what what are some of the terrible things that could happen here? Well, I think if the strike goes any longer than than January first, we're in a really really serious economic uh, problem for everybody. Um, right now, already, um, there's no certainly here in New Mexico. There's no work, and I know that because I was strike captain on picket lines that shut down the last two shows that were shooting here. Um, Ooh, and there's, they were shooting. Sh they were shooting. That, oh yeah, there were there were people still shooting. Yeah, uh, because the actors weren't on strike at that point. This was all before the actors went on strike. This was all back in June. But um, this week should have been the Emmy Awards, television's sort of greatest night. And there's certainly been a lot of great television. The last the last season of Succession, which got 27 Emmy Awards. Damn them! They beat the the record that was previously held by John Adams. But uh, shit! They, <laughs> Sorry. How dare they? <laughs> how dare they? They had, to, they had to postpone those until January because of the actor strike. The Oscars right now, which I think are scheduled for February, are now looking like they may postpone. You have major films like Dune that was going to be out just in a couple of weeks. That's now at the earliest going to be out in the spring of next year. So the release slates are all moved. Um, there's going to be a lot of damage. And I mean, during the writer's strike that I was talking about at the beginning of this conversation, people lost their homes, marriages broke apart, families broke apart. Um, 
people left the industry for good. Um, you've got um, industry workers, and I'm talking about everybody from assistant directors to makeup artists to props to armorers. I mean, everybody. Nobody's got work. And so far, with the support from the Teamsters, especially, and uh, IATSE, uh, which covers so many of the other crafts, the International Association of Theatrical and Stage Engineers, to put a face on that, um, there's been that support. But nothing is indefinite. So I think the worst thing that could happen is that we don't have some sort of joint deal for the writers and the actors by the end of the year. Then we are looking at, ah, uh, just it's a cliff at that point, I think. But creatively, if, if the uh, executives from these uh, platforms, they don't know anything yeah. because we know that yeah. they don't know. And they don't care. No, as, uh, as somebody no, once said to me, no, was I mean, he's the future ex-head of the studio, you know. See. Right. So, so, you know, and they are dominated by this uh, politics also that, you know, the people seems that they don't like what they see. Uh, so they right. don't really perceive what, what this should be perceived. Then um, it, artificial intelligence go up. So the worst for me would be, you know, to create things that they are, also regurgitations of uh, yeah. Yeah. the past uh, from this artificial intelligence that we can perfect because that we understand, we are technicians. <laughs> so so we, yeah. we, we perfect the artificial intelligence and we create things that they don't have any soul, but doesn't matter because there is a lot of people that they just want to sit and just wash it and sleep on it. So, <laughs> you know, that could be the, the worst for me, no? That there is... There is no critical okay, so, thinking. Yeah, two points there is that I should point out that in these negotiations that are happening this week, for the first time, you have, as far as I know, and this is rumor only, four of the studio heads or company heads in the room with their negotiator, their industry negotiator, and ours. You've got the head of Netflix, the head of Warner Discovery, the head of Disney and the head of Universal are there. The other perception that the people who don't, who are outside the business have is that the strike is over when all of the companies on the other side of the table, whether they're networks or streamers or cable, they all agree at once. That's not true. We can sign a guild, an agreement with each company individually, or with a group of companies individually. Um, we don't have to wait for everybody to go, yeah, these terms are acceptable for all of us. So in the past, the companies have simply been able to wait out the writers. And they said this, you will remember those awful headlines at the beginning of the Writers Guild strike where certain unnamed executives or industry spokespeople were saying, Let's wait until the writers lose their homes or lose their kids, you know, in a divorce. Then they'll come back to the table. They're not saying that now. And what what has happened is the reverse, is that we think, or, you know, that's the, the industry talk. There's now a crack among the companies because Universal Studios, which, of course, just came out with one of the two biggest hits of the year, Oppenheimer, one of the biggest hits ever, um, a film based on, by the way, entirely original content, not by Marvel, not coming from any other medium. Universal's got a different idea of what it wants than Netflix does, which has a different idea of what it wants than, say, Disney does, because they're different business platforms. So there could be a real scenario where by the end of this month, we're back in business. We can go back to work for, say, Universal or Disney or uh, for uh, Warner Discovery, but we can't go back to work for a certain number of other companies. But a certain number of people are back to work. That's the best case scenario. But that's right? absolutely fascinating because it's like you've got the actors, you've got the actors and writers on one side of the poker table. On the other side, you've got Apple, Hulu, you've got Netflix, you've got Disney, you've got all these other guys. Now, they're not only playing 
with the writers and the actors. They're also playing with the other guys at the same time. And that means right. what happens is if they come up with a sweet deal for the writers and the actors, that means they're going to have the first call. That means that, that basically the floodgates are open. They're going to be able to have their pick of the prime talent under this new deal, which will mean right. that the the other guys will go, whoa, 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 whoa hang on a sec, hang on a sec, hang on a sec. And they, so they'll be comp so, competing. Yeah. So the floodgates will open in one particular way because the other thing is they, like I, we said before, like uh, the, Mr. Agnew, the director, is that they don't actually want to lay all their cards on the table because that means that Apple will be like that. Oh, you've got that. Okay, okay. yeah, we, we got, ours are worse than that. Right, and Netflix will go well. <laughs> we we're just selling smoke. Nobody watches us anymore. They're all you know. They're all watching YouTube. <laughs> so I mean, this is what the Actors Guild has already tapped into. This, the Writers Guild is doing no agreements with anybody at the moment. SAG AFTRA has signed a number. I think they're up to about a hundred now. What are called interim agreements, and these are all with independent companies not affiliated with studios or major streamers, where in order to obtain an agreement, your company agrees to the terms that SAG-AFTRA is demanding right now. Not what they come up with, but what they're asking for right now. So this has benefited companies like A24, um, which has been able to promote its films at Venice at the Venice Film Festival and then at Toronto, which just recently ended. I was in Telluride, uh, which isn't a real celebrity based festival, but A24 could bring its people there because they'd signed an agreement. And they're doing that for the very reason Scott just outlined, which is because when this is over, they're at the head of the line. Screen right. actors go, go, these are good people. We want more of our people working with you guys. And as um, it was um, Jessica Chastain said on the red carpet at Venice when she was in a film for this company. She said, why is it that this company, which is independently financed, at a tenth, if not a hundredth of the bottom line of, say, Universal, can afford to sign the actor's contract and Universal and Netflix can't? Why is that? What's different about that? What, you know, what don't they want? Because... When you're looking at the demands, the combined demands of our guilds against the bottom line of these companies, you have to move the decimal point back three zeros. We're talking in millions or tens of millions of dollars against bottom lines that are in the billions. Yeah. Um, the, la uh, the last statistic I got from the guild, for instance, with Apple, what the Writers Guild was demanding was 0.0002% of their bottom line, Ooh. right? So this is why I think Scott's right that, you know, Apple can say, well, you know, guys, Netflix, you guys can hold out. You're, you know, making films in India and Spain and what all of this, but, you know, we're going to, we like, we like our platforms. We like our, the shows, we like our creators. We'll do an interim deal, you know? So I, I think that's where this is going to go. That's if I'm hopeful about anything, it's that that corporate greed is just going to destroy them in the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got some advice for you, Kirk. You're in you're in New Mexico. Uh, I don't know if there was a great TV show that was set there once. I think you should buy a camper van and maybe uh, take some chemistry lessons. <laughs> that van, that van I think is it's actually worth, now, things worth looking at. It's on the Sony Pictures lot, and I'm on strike against Sony. When I'm not, I go pick it up. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I, I think everything's po everything's possible. I mean, the 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 extraordinary thing, and and this is this is great. Thanks for thanks for this talk because the the oh. scope of it, nobody can really no. come to terms with it. Because yes. I remember, you know, it's like whenever anybody somebody says Quantum of Solace, and you go, well, it was done during the writer's strike. You know, there's massive properties, massive films with huge budgets that were that that suffered back in that particular moment in time. Right. And this, um, I think the same um, writer, I think Peter Agnew is his name. Um, he was, he was, he was saying that yeah, we're making a movie, and then we started getting calls from studios, and they're going, so how's the movie going? 
Um, so, so we're going to do the movie when it's done. Any ideas? You just want to? Can we see something? Uh, you, you got my card? Because they know that they are driving their their truck into a desert. Right. Exactly. Th there's yeah. nothing going to be there. I mean, they're going to be like, yeah. So how do you feel about I Love Lucy? It's a great show, <laughs> you know. You know, but because it's going to be, you know, it was always the complaint that there would be lots of reruns. But, you know, you're taking shows like, there was a show, a very interesting show called 1889, a very high concept oh, yeah. science fiction show, beautifully realized, totally international, uh, you know, extraordinary, beguiling Lovecraftian madness. And you were like, great, cancelled, you know. Right. That was one of the, we were talking about that earlier, that idea that, uh, that was a Netflix show, I think, that you yeah. just say, no, you know what, people have watched it. We're just going to take it off the platform. And so that scared a lot of people. It's like, whoa, wait a second. You took it off the platform? It's like, not even there. You can't search for it anywhere. Yeah, it's, like, it's they, they did that with uh, on Disney. They did that with Willow, uh, the, the, yeah. the TV show Willow, which was like, you know, it was, I think people just, it was just 100% hate watching. That everybody just was, <laughs> you know, just tuned in and they go, Let's see how much of a piece of shit this really is, you know. But that that's that's another aspect of, of fandom. People are very, very passionate. I, I, I wanted right. to speak to you, even if it's a little bit out of the subject, about this phenomenon, sure. which is also here in Europe, which is Barbie. I'd like to, to have your, uh, your, your take on this, uh, Kirk, if we can. So how sure. do you if see I could, I would do something with your shirt and make it pink right now. I no, <laughs> no, please. Uh, how, how, you know, what is your take so, in Barbie? Why, why this big success and how, how that, I only, you know? I only just saw the film about a week ago. Uh, because even in Santa Fe here, it was impossible to get a really good seat in the theater. Because it was booked, and it's, uh, it's just now, just this past week, I think, gone on to uh, pay-per-view. You can get it off of Amazon here in America at the moment for that. Oh. You can do it here in Spain as well. Yes, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, didn't yeah. know. Okay. Yeah, it's got a lot of good energy there. So it's a, it's a singular piece of work. I mean, um, I, I really do have to hand it to Greta Gerwig as both writer and co-writer and director of that because the film is unlike anything else that's out there. Um, and it, it it tapped into a nerve. Um, it's a, you know, it, it, it uh, look... I'm not, um, uh, I'll, I will say that I don't remember playing with Barbie dolls um, when I was younger. Me neither. But, uh, Your secret is safe with us, don't worry about it. <laughs> but certainly, you know, from, you know, my wife and her generation and, 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 and people in her circle, and, and they, they certainly did. And um, I think the film just became a, a cultural touchstone, especially for women, because it really does invert that whole sense of entitlement that men have had. I mean, yeah, look, I, I love Margot Robbie and, you know, thank God she was also the executive producer of that and got it, got it made. But it's really kind of a movie about Ken uh, in a sense and all the things that he goes through not being recognized and all of that. And I look, I enjoyed the turning of the tables as much as some of the women in the audience as well to that. You just don't know. Uh, what's, I mean, I've heard people, including in my social circle here, deride it as a very expensive advertising platform for Mattel. And there's no question that Mattel itself sees the film that way. But that's not why it took off. That's not why it took off no. around the world and made a billion dollars faster than, than Avatar did, faster than Titanic did. Um, you, you can't put your finger on that. I know Hollywood will try, you know, to do that. But the fact that you had that movie and Oppenheimer come out the same day, July, it was July 21st, it was two days after my birthday. Uh, and I remember that really, really well. That both of those films, the moment they were out of the gate and in theaters, took off. Um, and in Oppenheimer's case, a three-hour movie about a whole bunch of guys, and they're all men pretty much, in a room talking about nuclear physics that's going to hit a billion dollars within the next two weeks, that's unheard of. And there's no formula for either one of those films. And Barbie's phenomenon isn't just 
the marketing of it. It was, you know, you couldn't buy. Um, we weren't painting our house then, doing one of our rooms, but that color of pink, you couldn't buy it anywhere in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but they literally bought every candle. Hey, Kurt, candy. dude, uh, I've got a, I got a new business for you. Forget about the mess. <laughs> We're going to we're going into the painting business. That's what we're going to do now. Yeah. We're going to write in there. You and Fuchsia are going to become very good friends. Uh, let me see. There is there is. There's lots of questions. The, 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 just one thing I want to I want to oh. make a comment on that okay. is is that is that the fact that it was Barbenheimer, the fact that everybody's sense of irony was peaked yes. so entirely that it film became fun again for five minutes. It actually yeah. became uh, it became extraordinarily self-aware. Barbie also, I think, is an incredibly smart and incredibly subversive film. In it is. Terms that's the other thing. It is. It is. It is a film for adults. It's not a kids' movie. There's no question. I agree. <laughs> you know yeah. the idea in the Barbie's dance party that she turns around and goes, "Do you ever think about death?" <laughs> You're like, <laughs> I was like. Ooh, you know, it's, do you know these writers? The yeah. idea of using cognitive dissonance and dialogue in a movie about Barbie. I mean, th th it's it's very very interesting. A that it create. They were very smart. They didn't they didn't push a feminist agenda when in interviews right. in their marketing because that's alienated so many people. Men and women are sick of it having rammed down their throats. They avoided right. that to the extent it was like, up, oh, we're not going to talk about that. Right. The other thing is that. You can take it as being implicitly feminist and you can take it as implicitly humanist in the sense of right. of where the film actually ends up because it's it's actually not feminist it's actually it's, it's, we could accuse it of being a womanist film in many ways because exactly. because that's ultimately what 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 the, the the core of it is but i i think the kind of this kind of postmodern irony kind of like smirking hey let's go and see these two things and the great thing being that they're both extremely worthy films in their own particular rights um do you know the writers of the, the, the this couple from uh, barbie yeah uh, do i know them? i don't know them personally and i must admit that i'm not a fan of her husband's work noel bombach who's best known for things like the squid and the whale uh films about upper middle class east coast couples who have problems you really don't care about but <laughs> somehow somehow their somehow their sensibilities really work together and i must say to give them both credit, since we are talking about writing, America Ferrara has a three minute speech about midway through that film. Um, that, I mean, I knew women in the, in the audience were cheering it and I was moved. And it was it's exactly what Scott says, it's not feminist, it's humanist, but everything that her character says is so true. And it's true not only about women in American culture, but also about women in film culture. and that, that's the whole self-reflexive aspect of the yes. film. I got really bad news about that speech because somebody discovered that Marge Simpson made exactly the same speech in an episode of The Simpsons. Really? There's so many episodes of The Simpsons. No, there's so many so episodes That's, of The yeah, Simpsons. You're, you're gonna <laughs> the Simpsons, which is, the, along with South Park, The Simpsons is possibly the most crea the most subversive piece of American culture. I, you know, the, future generations will go, how the hell did they get away with that? <laughs> you know, right. you know, yeah. uh, it, there's, there, there's something, you know, there's, some, there's something incredibly beguiling about it because everybody felt like they were being told to go to the movies until those two films came along. That's, that's exactly, that's well said. That's exactly what happened. Yes. And then those two right. films came along and they were like, yeah, who cares? And also you had the perfect, you had the perfect, what was supposed to be the perfect girl movie and the perfect guy movie. Right. And, and and that's so it was it became like all right okay so we're gonna see Barbie but you know what we're gonna do we're gonna talk about nuclear fusion for three hours <laughs> that's what's gonna happen sweetheart <laughs> you know and then we'll walk the dog and fight and then you know go get pizza let, let, let's go and well, see yeah let's like, let, you can imagine what Oppenheimer created here because I live thirty eight miles from Los Alamos uh, where the bomb was invented and so the movie. Los Alamos, you have to understand, is a is a is a highly secured government site that exists within a town of no real particular interest. But since the movie, tourists have been coming up to New Mexico. They come straight up from the airport in Albuquerque. They drive right through Santa Fe. They go to they go to Los Alamos. 
they go up to the security gate and go, hey, where's my security pass? You know, I want to see the lab. It's like, dude, you can't see the lab. You know, why are you here? Well, I just saw Oppenheimer. So there's this whole Oppenheimer tourism that's happened here. And you're reminded that <laughs> movies can be a cultural phenomenon. Yeah. They really are. Look, there's, there's a historical train line that runs between Santa Fe and the old spur line of the Santa Fe Railroad that goes to Albuquerque that's owned by actually a group of art authors and artists here in New Mexico, including George R. R. Martin. I was told at an event the other night, they're going to be doing a Barbenheimer train ride. Um, <laughs> uh, and the Barbenheimer train ride with dinner. So you come eat a dressed, uh, come dressed either as Oppenheimer or Los Alamos employee or his Barbie. And we're actually tempted to go on that just to see who among our friends is silly enough to do that ride. But we'll see. But, but there's another thing is you're not going to do something like that unless you have a sense of humor, you know, unless right. you have a highly developed sense of irony. Yes. You know, we've gone to the, we do have gotten to the stage where, where some 80 years later that we can make a movie about one of the most devastating inventions of humanity True. and still not be frightened by it, which... Yes. Which is which is which is a, a testament to the survival of the human race in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, yes. we got something which is so pop culture it's beyond belief to the extent where yeah. you can't buy that shade of pink in you know and <laughs> you know in, in Home Depot, you know, yeah. you know that. So well, you brought that up, okay? And we we're talking about these companies and how they don't care about things. Yes. Let me let me talk about that for a quick second because. Um, the, the actors were, um, they had taken it before there's any kind of real movement. The guild takes what's called a strike authorization vote to determine what the appetite is for a strike among the membership. And ours was really high and screen actors guilds was even higher and they have more members. So this was in the beginning of July and they had had one sit down with the studios and their reps didn't go anywhere, but the studios asked for another couple of weeks so they could come up with the proposal in that couple of weeks. And so the actors delayed their strike vote. Well, as it turned out, the reason the studios did that <laughs> was because they knew Barbie and Oppenheimer were going to be opening in those two weeks and they needed those actors on the red carpets to promote the pictures before they went in theaters. Wow. So you may remember what happened. The, there, was a, there was a big premiere of Oppenheimer in London, uh, the day of the strike vote. And so all the actors were there to walk the red carpet. But in the time, and everybody was there, you had Killian Murphy and you had um, uh, Kenneth Branagh and um, uh, Matt Damon and everybody was there for it. But between the time of the red carpet and the, the premiere of the film at Leicester Square, the strike authorization vote was taken and all the actors went back in their limos to their hotels. And Christopher Nolan had to give the introduction to the audience by himself. Um, but that's what was happening. It came out later. The studios never intended, never intended to have a counter proposal. They were just waiting at the clock. Um, and they literally waited until an hour before doomsday, quite literally, with those two films, uh, before it became apparent that they weren't ever going to negotiate. And the actors went on strike that day. So it was just crazy. It's, also a, it's also a great indication for, because this is really unpaid work, promoting your movie. Um, <laughs> you know the actual power of doing the talk shows well mira you know look at that talk shows they're, they're, they're gone yeah they're gone and no not only are they gone but nobody's missing them <laughs> did you see the, the, all all of the jimmies all of the jimmies uh, and the colbert's they tried to do like what we're doing right now yes and they were really bad at it yeah it would no it was it's it's like oh, guys stop it you know it's like don't leave the house unless you got a got a writer's team with you you know what i mean it was it was extraordinary it was literally pulling back the curtain and discovering there was absolutely nobody there you know yeah 
you know, yeah. apart from it was just a guy in Home Depot looking for pink paint. <laughs> That's all there was. Let's let's go for the for the questions. Yeah, so they got lots of comments here. Um, we got uh, Gisela, who's in Barcelona, says Buenas noches, Buenas noches, todo el mundo. Uh, Eli, who is uh, of of Dutch origin from Uruguay, has worked internationally, and she's currently in Sevilla. Who's one of uh, our dearest friends. She has a very interesting talk. Um, so where are we going to get to? Uh, Jim says, who's in uh, in England right now? It seems as though corporate greed travels in larger circles than just the consumer. Well, we're talking, you know, what we're talking about there is millions upon millions upon millions. And Hollywood is hurting. Hollywood is really hurting. His box office is, you know, t Tom Cruise's film didn't make that much money. I don't think it did because everybody's waiting for part two. I, I, I you know, it's like when Kenneth Branagh... Um, put out Henry V, the studios went, what happens with people who haven't seen the first four? You know? <laughs> you know, that was, that, that was the story. No, it's, that's true. That's why the madness of George V or George IV was called the madness of King George. George III. Yeah. That's why it was called that. It was called the madness of King, of King George. George. Because they couldn't. Because they didn't think, whenever they think it was a sequel. Oh, Ellie says, what would happen if us, the public, go on strike? And stop consuming films from USA. <laughs> well, that will never happen, I think. Well, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I, I, not to not to disappoint you, but the the industrial power will override that. There's simply too much money to be made in foreign countries for that ever to stop. Uh, and American films continue to dominate regardless of, of reasons. I mean, I suppose that's the reason I enjoyed the U.S. film in France, because I saw so many films from Europe and the Middle East and elsewhere, you know. And once I learned enough French to read the, the subtitles, I could go see anything. And American films didn't have the dominance there because of those quota systems. So, see, yeah, She it's... says, well, as a matter of fact, I personally am watching all European films. Okay. Yeah, well, good so. luck with that. <laughs> good luck with that. If, you're, if you've ever been to a film festival... You know, it's one of those things that if you if you if you've ever been, I'm sure you've been on a festival jury, Mr. Ellis. I'm sure oh, you've yeah. done that, and that's pretty tough sometimes. <laughs> you know, uh, you're talking about uh, screenwriters. Uh, I've seen films that could have done with one. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh yeah. If, been if yeah. somebody had written in it, it's like it was written on the back of a cigarette packet. You know what I mean? Yeah. So let's go. It says Jim Talbot. Unfortunately. Uh, what is that? Uh, unfortunately, humanity is so divided that I doubt it would work, is, an, is answering um, Ellie. And uh, Ellie says, Jim, people said that about the Euro. Yeah. <laughs> and don't worry, they still do. And they still do. <laughs> Jasmina says... Another way of controlling what are the stories that are told and who are telling them, right? I don't know why we were... Well, look, th this is one of the, the... Barbie's a case in point because they tried it with G.I. Joe and that didn't work. They tried it with Battleship. That didn't work. Transformers did, you know, did well, but that's because it had... It was 100% Bayhem. You know, it was... Oh, right. Well, I'll, I'll steal that. That's good, yes. All right, yeah. Bayhem. There's yeah. a there's yeah. there's a there's a there's a great U, um, YouTube channel um, run by a guy called Patrick Willems who actually does an an analysis of all of uh, Michael Bay's films. You know, it's called Michael uh -huh. Bay an American Auteur, um, and he he actually takes like a cinephile's look at, at the Bay films and and looks. It's actually very very interesting the the, the things yeah. that characterize him. It's highly recommended. Yeah. That and Zack Snyder. The the curious thing about Zack Snyder is everything is based about him based on him trying to remake Excalibur. <laughs> no, it's true. And those of us who know, Anal Nadrach Uthvas Bethud, Dochil Tienve. But that's for the people who love Excalibur. That's, that's, that's this, 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 the spell of making, by the way, just in case you know. Um, okay, so here we go. So Jim says, if... if uh, the use you, if, uh, of AI, AI. is si a simple reduce outgoings, like paying actors and writers. It's all about maximizing profits. There's exactly. an element of right. maximizing profits, but there's another element of, well, you know, we can get them to do it. You know, it's, 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 there's an enormous yeah. amount of arrogance in thinking that you can, you can actually come up with something which is, what would you say, procedurally original and also pragmatically, you know, th th they can actually fix things, mm -hmm. you know, because right. AI cannot generate anything that's innovative, it can only recycle 
formats that exist or literature that exists or anything else. So there won't be anything groundbreaking because anything that was groundbreaking that, uh, that AI has vacuumed up or hoovered up won't be groundbreaking anymore. So. Yeah, the the other issue is, although I do highly recommend that if you need a good translator, ChatGPT is an excellent translator. Yeah, yeah but that, uh, that, that's what I'm talking about. That's the, that's the positive aspect of it, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Says, well, it says here, Ellie, it says, uh, AI is an amazing tool in medicine. It has already proved successful discovering a new drug for an old illness. Mm, there's... Nobody's nobody's denying that. It's like the woman who diagnosed her son with uh, with a particularly strange neurological order after yes. you know by putting it in there. Yeah. But um, you know the tr you know one one thing is discovering the uh, the neurological issue that uh, that somebody may have, and the other one is trying to fix that uh, third act. You know what I mean? How are we going to make that third act work? Mm -hmm. You know, because there's the, there's not a, the machine of story is doesn't work in a binary way. It isn't on and off. It's the, the story exists in this gray netherworld between who we think we are, what we want to be, and the way we understand what that is. AIs right. are, are very smart, but the the the, the fundamental essence yes. of humanity it's not doesn't exist. Yes. No, because the, the, the you know it's like I love the adage that the we that laughter is when the head is feeling, and tears are when the heart is thinking. Hmm. That, that this idea of that when something is truly emotional is because it is absolutely saturated and sodden with meaning. Hmm. Um, and that sort of extant kind of existentialism. I mean, you know, yes. No, it's just not going to happen. Man. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. You know, you, you, I'm, what am I going to do? The minute I can show an AI the first nine minutes of up, if I don't have a sobbing AI, we're not in business. You know what I mean? I want that AI to like be reaching for Kleenex by the time it's finished there. Ellie says, I am, uh, or, uh, what is that? I am a different question. I am right now in USA. How can I get one of those <laughs> shirts? <laughs> ah, All right, well, join a, join a writer's go picket line. You'll get one. So. Ah, okay. So if join the picket line. They're on, they're on going. We're picketing the studios. In LA every day, so. Okay, he, she's in Miami. So what's? Tell uh, me what's what's the what's the feeling on the ground? What's what's the um, what's the atmosphere? Are people hopeful? Is there a lot of? Because usually when when you know, as you know, in storytelling, you can really define a character when you when you give them some terrible things to deal with and decisions to make. Is the uh, is the is the spirit high? Is, are spirits high amongst everybody? I think they are. I think from what I hear, I'm obviously not there, but um, I'm, I'm uh, in contact with people who are, and, and all the spirits seem to be very good. Nobody is, uh, nobody's losing hope. Nobody's losing energy. Nobody's, nobody is anything but hopeful for a good outcome at the moment. No, that's uh, that's good. I, I mean, the the one of the great things that w that comes out of uh, out of hardship is hopefully it will it will it will increase and solidify a sense of community. In yeah. what is effectively a bunch of people sitting in front of keyboards, mm -hmm. you know, you know, staring at you know, like well, postcards. This, this, strike is, this strike has done that even more than past strikes. It's 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 put people together. It's introduced people, and it's put together, um, you know, whether it's writers and actors, or writers and teamsters, or yes. uh, writers and writers and electricians. They're all, you know, people are, are talking to each other. They're all That's recognizing good. a That's shared good. sacrifice. I'm going to tell you my favorite producer joke. How many producers do you does it take to change a light bulb? Go. The, ans the answer is, do we really need a light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, is that necessary? Uh, Francisco says, doesn't this situation benefit independent productions out of the union? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. No, not necessarily non-union, but what we were talking about earlier with A24 and these companies that have gotten interim agreements to shoot films, by all means, if there are going to be any victors out of this, initially, it's the independent companies, because those companies are able to sign those agreements and continue on with the work. Yes. So, so that because are, says that the streaming platforms are going to need something to keep it going, he says. And Robert well, says, uh, sorry, sorry, say Kirk. So, yeah, yeah, the streaming platform depends on what platform you're talking about. 
uh, we talked about this before you went on air, but I think we talked about it since. Netflix, for instance, can weather the strike, I think, forever because they can invest all their money in, 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 in series and films in Spain, in, in Korea, in India, where they're sp investing a lot of money. Now they're investing money in Africa. So the streamers, certain streamers can go elsewhere. Some of them are more reliant on the L.A., New York, Hollywood model. But it just depends. That's why I think there's going to be this cracking among these companies. It's, it's one point. of the things that we were talking about before we came on air. Uh, also, about uh, there's an article in the Guardian the other day about the uh, what's happening in the UK. If you look, uh, you look about 18 months back, there was so much production there that they were opening schools for technicians and film people left, right, and center. They quickly trained up a whole bunch of people with government money to work in the film industry, film and TV industry. And now I think the technical term is the ass has fallen out of it. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, and so, so that you're you're talking about a lot of things. I mean, that's the interesting thing about the question about independent independent features, etc. The price of an independent feature is the price of you know an entire TV show here, you know, um, you know, in the United States. Right. They're very different economies, very different uh, ecosystems. The 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 places that I mean, the UK film industry is is in pieces right now. Apparently, Disney just cancelled their ten year contract for you know they had half a Pinewood or Elstree or somewhere like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can you can bowl in those sound stages now. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. Look, Lorena says here's a here's a question, sort of a lateral question. She says New Mexico's landscapes are different community, and different communities are truly enchanting. They uh, Francisco and Lorena used to they used to live in Santa Fe and they they studied ah. film there. Uh, how have they influenced your screenplay writing process? And he says I miss that for I lived there for many years and missed them. How were you influenced by the landscape in in New Mexico? Um, not so much in, in terms of stories because See. It, it, it's often about what you can what you can sell. But out my window here, I've got about a two hundred seventy degree view of the countryside, and it's always inspiring. Um, except in the winter, which they'll remember, which can get really gray and is a creative buzzkill. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's always it's always it's always inspiring. It's always inspiring to. Uh, uh, if you if you wake I say if you wake up here and you can't work, you can't put words on a page. Just stop what you're doing. Um, it's the it's the funny thing is I always suggest if you really want to be inspired as a writer, you should probably move to London, but get the hell out before you you get too depressed. <laughs> well, I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't. As Samuel Pepys says, the man who is tired of London is tired of life. <laughs> But he wore a wig. Let's just face facts, you know. So take whatever he said with a pinch of salt. Robert Giordano says, "Wouldn't it be lovely? He's in New York. Wouldn't it be lovely to see a surge in support for indie film? Really sad situation going on, but hopefully something changes soon. Fascinating, fascinating discussion. Thank you. Ah, look, talk of the devil. I'm sorry. I got my, my friend Mr. Newton here, who is the one I was talking about, who's moved up into the Northeast. He says, "I get the feeling that the writers can find a deal that works, but a deal for the actors." Actors, as it currently stands, is not possible without tearing up the entire streaming model. Do you think there is a bigger compromise to be made by the actors than the writers? Excellent question. Good to see you. We spoke the other Thank day. Thank you, Newton. So I can't, obviously, I can't speak for the actors, but I, don't, I think that there's, there's truth in what he says um, in, in terms of what the actors are looking for, in terms of what they've got on the line and just the sheer numbers they possess over the number of people in our guild. But when, to a certain degree, the writers are also looking at, well, I think where we do agree is that we don't know what the streaming model is for compensation because they won't tell us what it is. It's that, it's that black box argument again, um, trying to get a peek at it. Um, but, and, and I mean, and then the, the, the negotiating committee, um, uh, Fran Drescher, and I love the, I love the name of a sad actress negotiator, Duncan Crabtree Ireland. And he is terrific. He's on the front of all the picket lines. He's the, the, he and Fran are always there on the podium at the, at the, at the public talks. Duncan but, Crabtree Ireland. I hope he has like a whippet and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, a silver topped cane. <laughs> and, and he has a mustache that, that needs to be waxed. That's awesome. It's like one of, the, one of those bad headmasters in an old hour gang short. You know, so... <laughs> Um, 
but but I mean, one one thing is that it, is that we we're trying to they're they're trying to pretend that this is a business they don't need to redefine, and we're saying it's a t- entirely new business, and we need to start from scratch. So in that sense, you know, are we both are both guilds attempting to tear up the contract? Yeah, yeah, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, until they open the black box, uh, that, that's that that will ultimately be it. Do, do you think um, legislation legislators would need to step in at some point and say, "All right, you you we we need some transparency here"? Is that a possibility? Where they're going to go? Well, everybody's offered. Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, offered to get involved with this. The mayor of L.A., Karen Bass, offered to get involved. You've had uh, people on the governmental level in New York. Um, you've had people on the federal level here in Washington, and we we both guilds have said no. It's really not your affair. This is between us and the companies. Um, Hollywood was regulated for a while, and you know nobody wants that again. <laughs> right. So it's, yeah, we're nowhere in trouble when when it's so like the Pope spoke openly today of how he was willing to intervene <laughs> in the uh, negotiation between the writers and the actors. But I mean, the the reason you've got people like Gavin Newsom. And the mayor of L.A. coming in is that we're talking about billions of dollars in revenue across every business in the city and across the entire state of California. And that's partly true in New York as well. Uh, But the city is losing revenue. The state is losing revenue. So, yeah, they have a financial interest in this. And um, I don't know what pressure they may be bringing to bear on some of these companies but as far as our our position is we don't need them in the room it's one of the things that I, we don't I, need them in the room no, no of well no the curious thing is it's a little bit like the miners and and the people who run the mine it's like yeah. okay there's no coal coming out of the ground nobody's selling any coal nobody's buying any coal you know so what what they, and this is the industry this no, no, is but, the mine but what they what they and can, they mine dreams yes no <laughs> i mean they can what they can put on the table is just the contrary of what we want right which is you know to solve the problem but uh, you know really going deep into the into the thing they 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 are not going to do that what they want is just you know is that the things as if they were and that's it no? well that ain't gonna happen no that ain't gonna happen no well let's 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 L- lorena has an interesting one he says in 2018 everyone was buzzing about the santa fe studios and the opportunities it brought for filmmakers and actors how is the situation there now also do you well, prefer everything. also do you prefer green chili or red chili that seems like i oh, think that's I- the I was answered that question by saying Christmas is my preference. Okay, Red so and green. yeah, good. But one of the one of the greatest beers I ever tasted was a chili beer, which I think was probably from your neck of the woods. <laughs> it's a beer with a chili in it. You know, w- welcome to New Mexico. If it moves, stick a chili in it. <laughs> so, how uh, are the studios there in Santa Fe? Well, they're all dark. They've been dark. They've been dark really since uh, the end of June, and they'll stay dark until production is back up and running again. But wow. up until that point, up until that point, we were doing really well. I mean, after California and maybe Georgia, although that's, you know, that's debatable, um, we were the number three location in terms of uh, revenue uh, for film. So. Apart from apart from the, uh, the, the Barbenheimer model railway, is there a lot of like Breaking Bad um, tourism? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, the woman who, the woman who owns the... Um, well, Walter Whitehouse, I think, finally had to put a gate around it, like a like a board fence around it, because the buses. It was the end of a cul-de-sac, so the buses would come. Everybody would disgorge, and she was, you know, she was literally one of those get off my lawn people. So finally had to uh, board it up. But no, that's going on. Um, yeah, still. It's it's great, you know, like a a show which is about a hotbed of methamphetamine dealing. You know, yeah, let's go there. Mm-hmm. I guess it's the same philosophy that says, let's go to Los Alamos. Maybe they got some rides for the kids. You know, it's a very, very peculiar thing. Look. Oh, Francisco says green for me, huh, by the way. Green for me. Okay. Green for me. I, I, I'm in Spain. They, it's very hard to find spicy here. Yes. You know, you guys. Well, send, are, send me an address. I'll send you some chili. Yeah, it's oh, no 
Yeah. Okay, well, I will definitely take you up on that. That's that's the best offer I've heard all day. Well, thank you very much. You've been with us for two hours. Thank you very much. And we would be another two. And perhaps we have to do See, another Kirk, two. See, Kirk, love to. I would love to. If you're available one day, I would love to uh, talk to you about um, the your approach to ad adaptation. I'd love to talk to you about storytelling. I'd love to talk to you about about your experience of working in writers rooms what the best sort of collaboration is because um it's one of those things that um i i find these days that people people write before they talk um you know what i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of writing and not a lot of thinking and and this um the the sort of interaction and the exploration of of, of story with, with you and a, a bunch of other people are basically writing the movie and you know out loud is something which is which is it's certainly missing here it's certainly something people the, the this idea of storytelling is is a uniquely solitary process until somebody flops a, a script down in front of you and you go you realize the entire first page is nothing but the description of a room right <laughs> I, I will say that 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 difference in culture um writer's room versus single writer and stuff that was something that was it made me attractive to companies when I was working in, in France because they love the idea that an American writer or a writer of, you know, who's been around the business as long as I have would be willing to work with younger writers to talk to them about that storytelling thing. So let's plan another. Yeah, I do. I, I got to tell I got to tell you my, my, my story of um, in terms of transparency when you're working with greats. I uh, I did Goya's Ghosts with uh, Milos Forman. Right. Oh yeah. And and yeah. the and the um the the read through process was all the actors there: Natalie Portman, Stellan Skarsgård, Javier Bardem, me, and a whole bunch of other people, and Milos Forman, and Jean Claude Carrier, right, in the room, and we used it. We did it over two days, and they used it as like a rehearsal. And also, it was literally Milos Milos going. I think I think that he's talking too much there. Can he perhaps? speak about something and Jean-Claude will be like, yeah, what happens if he does that? Oh, that works. So it was, it was completely yeah. open source. And, and, yeah. and that is so nice, Kirk. We should do things like that. Actors and, 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 and writers. I think that we don't work enough together. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. And that was, I mean, look again, we're, we're getting off topic, but one of the greatest things about working on, I mean, the Franklin, the Franklin show is the best thing I've ever done. I don't. I think I, if I don't ever do anything again, this is You'll a good to go out on. <laughs> and it was it was the best creative experience. Tim Van Patten and I, who had worked together, Tim directed all eight episodes. Who was an actor before he became a director, ran a really no drama set, and there was constant collaboration. Um, um, I was working with another writer, Howard Corder, who also lives here in Santa Fe, coincidentally. But the actors came with ideas. Um, there were always those things that would happen during production. It's like, whoops, okay, we're not going to get that weather. We're not going to get that look. What are we going to do? And we were all doing it. And we were, it wasn't that we were constantly rewriting the script, but whenever there was an inspiration, we went with it. And That's nice. How was the relationship with Paul Giamatti? Because uh, I, I, I consider him being one of the, the finest actors alive uh, from my point of view. Um, yeah, was, was he a terrific. good collaborator? Uh, Paul was terrific. Paul, um, Paul's the only actor I worked with who could actually improvise in 18th century period English dialect uh, from America. <laughs> uh, occasionally refused to call a cut to see what would happen. You know, he, but that was because Paul's father was, was president of Yale uh, and he grew up in, in, a, in a household of history and books. So, but no, Paul was Oh, Paul, Paul was absolutely great. Um, and I'll be interested when you see the, the series next year. Eddie Marsan plays that role in the new, in the Franklin show. And it's a very inverted version of that character. So see what you think. Uh, Eddie, oh, I love Eddie, to see it. Eddie Marsan is the actor that I point out when people go, yeah, but all actors are really beautiful and gorgeous and, and perfect with great bodies. <laughs> I'm like... I'm like this. <laughs> what about exhibit A? You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. It's it's like you know, it's That's extraordinary that how how somebody can be, be so, who can be so ubiquitous in so many very different things. I mean, like him and uh, Ray Donovan, because you got right. you got um, 
um, you know, you've got Re- Liev Schreiber, and you've got, uh, I can't remember his name right now, uh, father of Angelina Jolie. John, um, John, John Voight. Voight. You're Voight. talking about some heavy hitters, and you're from, you're from England. And you're playing the most quinta not just that, but you're playing a, a you know somebody from Boston. You know you, th- you know you're talking about something which is very deep state American. <laughs> you know, and you pull it off with a plum. Well, yeah. let's anyway, go. Let's great. go because it's, Kirk, it's late. Everybody, everybody is is very. <laughs> Kirk says, uh, Francisco says, come back, Gisela. Who, come back, please. She's Kirk, a, fascinating. Uh, Jasmine says, thank you so much, Kirk Scott. Something's been very interesting, important to receive. It's absolute gold what you've given us because. All we ever get is is every, everything is filtered through the news. And the trouble with journalism today is the left says it's raining, the right says it's not raining. They report that, but nobody looks out the window. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys, you guys enjoy it. I'll go back to not writing. Right? Okay. So. Yes. You, you know, I want to see like a padlock on your on your keyboard i want you to desynchronize your bluetooth keyboard that's what i want you to do i want you to do thank you kirk thank you very 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 thank, much thank you so much and for for writers and actors united well we're going to have a brief after show so you can you can stay for that where we can yes. talk about scurrilous things but but uh thank you very much for being here remember to subscribe and do all those cultural things we'll be back tomorrow in spanish at 8 p.m it's been a delight and thank you very much uh, everybody and as we always say upwards and Onwards. Onwards. There we go. All right, we're, we're, we're back for that after show. But th- that, that we're just saying that that's one of the things that never occurred to me, that you got Apple, Netflix, who everybody's got their cards right up against their chest, and they're going, no, 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 it's, uh, you know, yeah, we we have a lot of viewers, but not that many, uh, you know. So it's it's all kind of rather peculiar, everything that's going on there. And how is the guilt? Is very transparent about these negotiations, or there are things that they are yeah. not being said? No, 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 they'll, they'll talk to us when they've got something to say, but they're not going to... To, to tip their hand in the middle of a negotiation. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so they've been very clear about where things are moving good, up to good, this point. Good. It's extraordinary because, because I mean, I know you, 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 uh, you've done the Memorial Day. Um, oh, yeah. That, oh, yeah, that was, I was able to do that because that was a different contract. That was done through public broadcasting. And that contract was still in effect until the end of July. So I got lucky and I could do that one job. So it was year. basically you and Big Bird. That was it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but but that 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 that's a, that's a, a sort of a, a, an absolutely fasc- fascinating thing. You know, the historical epics. We've got Napoleon coming up. You know, the, also Apple. A, yeah. 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 There's there's a real there's a real thirst for 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 history and the epic. And it's one of those things that, that I think happens sometimes because- I really want to see cont- it. Contemporary history is so confusing. No, Franklin. It, Assumpta has a copy of Derek Washburn's Napoleon script. Oh yeah, I know that one, sure. Yeah. 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 I've got, a copy. I've got yeah. a copy of Coop. Uh, um, Which one? Yeah, Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon oh, script. Oh, I see. I see, I yeah. see. Well, Derek- all right, that's nothing. I've got a copy. <laughs> I got a copy of Walt Disney's Walt Disney's uh, the autobiography. You know, Life of Goebbels. That's what I've got. <laughs> but it was a wonderful script. Uh, this Napoleon one it was for Jack Nicholson, and of course the studio didn't, you know, didn't want to do it, and just bought it and let it. You know, the poor writer wrote, wrote it, but. They never were gonna do it, and I, I was thinking that that is also, you know, a very. You sad know what story. they should do. You know how. Uh, the, no, very but you're f- writing for something that you know that is not gonna be never. Well, there's something very, fa- you know, the very famously there is the blacklist in in Hollywood. There's the list of yeah. I don't mean I don't mean the Ilya Kazan blacklist. I mean the, the you <laughs> know, the, yeah, yeah. yeah, of great unproduced, un- great unproduced scripts. Somebody should actually come up with. Somebody should come up with the gray list. Which is great scripts from yesteryear that never got made. <laughs> There's got to be some awesome scripts out there. I suppose the guild would be, you know, yeah. and the academy as well. Yeah, has those as well. 
Well, I think the gr then the gray list is an excellent name for it. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, we got to go. Thank you, Kirk. Kirk, thank you so much. We're in touch. It's so good to see you again yeah. after so much time. I know you as well. Let's not let 20 years go by and do send me those links, okay? Send oh, me yes. The links. I do send you the links of a, a Network of Freedom. Yes. Absolutely. And uh, thank you very much, sir. And thanks to everybody else yeah. out there. It's been great. And uh, we love you all to bits. And uh, as we soon. say in Spanish, Mañana más y mejor. Chao, Kirk. Chao.